Yeah, I would like to yeah, go with you probably on a mental excursion in space and time and I would like to start at the really beginnings of legal education when we have the first laws on legal education on law schools and what is the fundament for later theoretical schools where we have discussed yesterday on. So it's an invitation to follow me to uh, yeah, ancient times, but how have I found this subject? And that was at this wonderful campus in the green, probably you have no idea where it is, it's the Turkish-German University in Istanbul, very close to this third airport which is built now, also in a natural reservoir which is now completely destroyed and uh, many new university buildings are there. But this was the first semester of a first new law school, Turkish-German, in Istanbul in the year 2013-14. And we started with seven law students, five of them you see here. One is taking the photo, another taking coffee. And then we started to think of what is European legal history. That was yeah, the subject of my teaching there, and the German Ministry of Education invited me to start with the students. And then I came there and then I was thinking, yeah, what is their cultural background? What do they know? And I realized that their historical understanding started in the year 1453, because then the Turkish took over Istanbul and before there was blank, nothing. No Greek, no Latin, no Romans. And uh, then I asked them, but you are in Istanbul, you know at least how it was called. One person said, oh, Constantinople, one of six or seven. And then I thought, yeah, have you ever been to the city center with eyes for Roman history? And they said, no, never. And then I said, okay, I will completely change my law program and not teach in the European way. As I was asked by the German ministry, they already told, and you must teach very German. And I thought, okay, I left Germany in 92. What is German teaching nowadays? So I said, okay. I don't know what they want, but I know what they need. And then we really went into the city. And so it started that we, with law texts in our hand, we went to Istanbul and said, OK, now we have in the Codex Theodosianus this little piece. And it's referring to a library, to a university. This must be this place. Yeah, I was at that time also a guest of the German Archaeological Institute, which was yeah, fascinating because on the one hand I was teaching law, but I had all the sources from archaeology, from, from literature, everything around me in this wonderful library at the German Archaeological Institute. And this interdisciplinary field research I also tried to teach to the students when walking through the city. And I don't know how many of you have been to Istanbul, there's the Hagia Sophia, and really on the other side of the Hagia Sophia, you have something which is called Million, the place where you had the directions to all the rest of the Roman Empire. And we know exactly at that place of the Million, there was a big hall where was the market, the court, the first library, and there we also find some texts in the Codex Theodosianus. So all our excursions started at this place where I have this blue thing, and there we started. Then we went on to the Hagia Sophia, because there's this very famous mosaic of Emperor Constantine, who really founded the city, and he also wanted to make a cultural capital out of it. And that is then where we know today yeah, also with his red pillar. There we was his first yeah, library, court hall, all that. And today you find there a, a, a cistern, so a water reservoir from Justinian. And some of the pillars are still from these old buildings. So that is what we still find today. When we then have a look into non-legal sources, we see that in uh, 357 Timistius, an orator, politician, he wrote yeah, a speech and there he says, oh yeah, the son of Constantine, he gave us a scriptorium for copying books and he also founded a Greek Latin library. And at the same moment, we also have the first legal text to say, yeah, we have here Constantinople and we need a lot of magistrates. So you must imagine a small country, a small city and you need everything, administration, new culture, teaching, books, 
yeah, you must really build up out of nothing a capital. And there we have also this constitution asking for magistrates who are skilled in writing. So we see there's really a movement towards writing, learning, education. And at that time, you must really think, yeah, like in small jurisdictions, it's nepotism, it's corruption, and also that you can very clearly see that it's really depending on the people who do something. And then we see, yeah, this Constantine was a father. His son then started to build the city. Then one of his personal advisors, his Temestius, was also helping to create this library. This Temestius was also friend of a prefect of the city, so a very small community, and in among them, they built up this university and the later library and all this. But very important was also an emperor, Julian. He was so different to what we had before, because you must imagine the normal, yeah, Roman emperor comes, has a military background. He normally speaks Latin and is not so, let's say, uh, well educated. And this Julian was very different. He read a lot, he was also writing, he had a wonderful education because yeah, he was too young to be dangerous to his uh, yeah, co fellows and he was therefore educated by a bishop, but then he realized, no, Christianity is nothing for me, I remain Roman pagan. Then all the others around him spoke Latin, but he had a fundamental Greek education and yeah, very skilled, and he was also, yeah, a lot supported by the former, or by the second wife of Constantius. She gave him all books, and he was really, yeah, he read a lot. And he also gave all his books to this later library in Constantinople, and uh, built also a new wing of the library. And the, he also, yeah, read a lot in Greek, and a little bit in Latin, and this funds of his books he gave to the library. And then from yeah, later writing, we know that there were already 120,000 volumes. Yeah, but that's quite difficult for us to understand how much is it. Normally one role is seen as one book, but what we see now as a book was normally yeah, having different volumes in order to make it. So it's very hard for us to identify how much this was already, but quite a lot, yeah. Then we need also yeah, always legal text. And then as my students, I was studying this text which is now the first uh, legal text really on a foundation of a library. And here we see some yeah, details. Here you see this Roman Empire was di divided into East and West. And we see AAA that are Augusti emperors that were at that time yeah, son and father, Valentinian and Grazian for the West. And for us interesting is only yeah, the third A, it's Valens. And those who have been in Istanbul, you still see the Valens aqueduct, this water yeah, line. And he was also giving some yeah, constitution and saying to Clercius, the prefect Urbi, the uh, state prefect, that he shall look for seven antiquarians. These were librarians who could also copy books, but also repair them and could write also, so they knew a lot. And uh, then he also already asked for four in Greek and three in Latin. And uh, this, I think, is because of the stock of the books, because Timestius, Julian gave all their books, and that was mo 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 yeah, mostly in Greek, and therefore he, we already have here yeah, four in Greek and three in Latin. That is what we find also in Rome, that there are bilingual libraries, because, yeah, it was the Greek heritage coming to the Romans, and therefore we have, for example, also you see it today in Rome, in the Caracalla Terme, you have a Roman Latin library and a Greek library. And this is also what we saw, especially in Constantinople, that also the background of the emperors was different. Constantius Valens, they spoke Latin, then Julian Greek, then the official language of the city changed to Greek, then after finishing the Corpus Juris Civilis, the whole legal language also became Greek. But what was interesting, there was no bilingual education. You were either or. And also our librarians, they were working in Greek or in Latin, but never a mixture. And also the whole city, I think your whole social network was either in Latin or in Greek. So it was really parallel worlds. 
and no education in both languages. Yeah, for my students, it was always interesting to see how that looked like. Here are some reconstructions, which we know a little bit from excavations in Ephesus, which we can still see there. You have on the right side the Celsius Library, which is still un yeah, until today there, from 150. And we could imagine that in Constantinople at the yeah, Metropole, it was even much more beautiful, two, three, five-story houses. And then you had these wonderful halls where also yeah, library and later law school took place. Then we already have in the fifth century quite some legal teaching, but so far not real by a legislative yeah, measure. We know that in Rome was legal teaching, Salona, Carthago, Narbonne, Lyon, and in the east very famous Beirut, and then later Constantinople. But how that looked in the beginning, it was really personalized. There was a teacher, he asked money, students paid, and then he was telling them about law. And only in 425, we really have a law saying now we institutionalize it. We will have a given building, a given auditorium, and the Senate chooses who may teach. And only these elected 31 teachers are allowed to teach students. And then outside that building also private teaching may happen. When we see that from a linguistic point of view, we see yeah, Latin was a lingua franca, franca for, la, for law. Then yeah, until Justinian, sixth century, legal teaching was in Latin only. But what was quite interesting, we find a constitution from the year 397. Then in court, you were already allowed to speak Greek. So it's like a minority protection as we know today, that first you start giving access to the court system and there already a very early constitution that in court Greek was allowed. Then also we see again, it's really linked to one person, this Sirius. He was a prefect of Constantinople and within 10 years he, he changed the administration and said we need more in Greek here also. Then the Codex Theodosianus, more or less at the same time, there we have little text already in Greek, and then only in the 5th century, in the late 5th century, then we have the first law books also in Greek. But that is really that somebody gave lectures in Latin and somebody else made abstracts indices in Greek. And then in 425, we have the start of the institutionalizing of legal teaching. And that was then that in public auditoria, there were only those professors chosen by the Senate, and that were only two for law, so it was quite yeah, small. As we know, only normally a professor had some 15 students. Some of the philosophers had 80, but so it will be 30 to 50 law students, not that many. And then next to it, some private teachers who were also te teaching. Yeah, this was 425, and then in 433, Justinian came, and he was really, yeah, power, control, administration, everything must be organized. And he also said, yeah, in Athens and in some other places, those teachers don't behave, and he closed some schools also. And at that time, then, we had only three law schools in Constantinople, Rome, and Beirut, and very controlled, and everywhere only two up to four probably law teachers. So really still a very small scale. And Beirut was really the top of the top and students from all over the Roman Empire went there and some yeah, of the sources say the teachers of all the civilized world were to be found in Beirut. But as things happen in 551, an enormous earthquake destroyed the school in Beirut and also many of the students were killed and at least one professor could escape and became then professor in Constantinople. But also in Constantinople, history went on, and even there, then some 50 years later, everything was closed. And then we had a shorter yeah, time without any law schools, and then it restarted mainly in Greek, in Antiochia, in Zidon. The study program became also stricter and stricter. It lasted for five years. So like nowadays, more or less, it's also fascinating to know that they studied five years. It ran from early autumn to early summer, and it was only in the afternoon. Then the students and the teachers met, 
and normally in the morning the professors had their clients and they were also practitioners. Then in 425 we have this very important legal source which says, yeah, the city is growing. It was really amazing how Constantinople from a small village became a capital and then you also needed a new structure of the inner city and then at the Capitol, which is some two kilometers from the original place, a real university yeah, was built and then we even know some details, how the auditoria looked like, that you don't hear noise and whatever, some light. So everything was detailed in these constitutions and we have 31 chairs already for grammar, for sophists, philosophy and two for law. So only two still for law. And when you are a professor for 25 years, yeah, you get some certificates, so all that was also organized. Yeah, for my students it was always yeah, important to visualize it, and I couldn't unfortunately find any picture of Theodosius II, but at least at the Hippodrome I could show them that's the father and the grandfather. So we always went to the Hippodrome where you have this basili this. Uh, obelisk in the middle, and there you see at least of Theodosius II, the father and the grandfather. Then we proceeded our walk always to this Capitol, and at this place until today is the State University of Istanbul. So it's really, yeah, founding history on that place where in 425 the university was founded. Until today you find now the State University of Istanbul. And the curriculum at that time, fifth century, was already completely defined. So these five years, in the first years, you really got the basics from the Gaius institutions and mainly on testaments and legacies. This was important because many people were soldiers and they lost their sons, their brothers, their fathers, and then those remaining need to know what can I do with, yeah, after the death with testament legacies. Then dowry, guardianship, so also yeah, for women when they married, what to give the other family. So all this the basics of family law, we could say, in the beginning and then only in the last year they really looked what were the yeah, emperors doing. Very shortly here an overview. This is then from the time of yeah, before Justinian because he changed the institutions of Gaius to his own institutions. He mainly took over what Gaius wrote and changed it a little bit. And then we already see that in the sixth century we also have a final exam at the end. In the beginning there was nothing and then later they really had to pass a final exam, the testificatio, and that I would say is more or less the beginning of what we now call a university, that you have a curriculum, you have a building, you have a place, and that you even get some paper when you finish it. Yeah, we know a little bit from sources, records, because many students wrote, like we know from Savigny, that some students wrote about it, and uh, here also the same, that they heard the Latin lectures and they wrote some abstracts in Greek. And so we know a lot of it. Even Justinian, who was really regulating everything, he said no written commentary on my codification. And so everything was quite clear and yeah, really receptive and repetitive. Teaching, as I already said, mainly in Latin, but Many people came from all over to study in Constantinople with a Greek background, and then they were at least they are passively act, they are able to listen to the Latin and then make abstracts in Greek. Only in the year 5055, we know that Julian gave for the first time something in Greek also in Constantinople. So quite late, after we had already the Corpus Juris Civilis, and that we know because a book came out of it which is still existing. Then for uh, law teachers, fascinating because it's like a bilang, it's a scolia sinaitica from 450 more or less, and there we now have a kind of glossar where we really have terms, expressions from the Latin legal literature translated into Greek but keeping terminology. So that's fascinating to see because then a Latin word, yeah, described in Greek from that time. So around 550, we are really on the top of legal teaching in Constantinople. And this is also a grace to Justinian, 
But unfortunately, he died, 565. He invested a lot in the university, rebuilding it also after a fire, an earthquake, and some civil commotion. And so again and again, he really invested a lot in the university. And then his successor said, oh, it's so costly, university. No, we do not want to yeah, support anymore by public means the university and so practitioners took it over again. And the instruction became less scientific, more rhetorical, and this horrible focus later came, and he burned down even the university building and then destroyed the whole university. And after that, for some 150 years, there was nearly nothing. Let me conclude. Yeah, from the point of language, so Latin remained for a long time the teaching language, but more and more Greek was accessible. But it was never equal, not authentic translations, whatever. It was more receptive, and then you yeah, were taking your notes in Greek. So Latin remains the main language, but Greek came more and more in it. And then in the 8th, 9th century, it became completely Greek. But I stop yeah, in 606, as I <laughs> proposed in the beginning. And the law schools here, I think that's very interesting, because that is something which in the schools of sorts comes back in the beginning. It's very personalized. One teacher is a student, and this is the cosmos in it. Then we have this institutionalization of legal teaching. Everything is planned, the building, the the yeah, auditoria, the curriculum, everything is planned. And then after that, after this is destroyed, it moves back to this personalized approach. And also when we look back to these 150 years of university history, we see that we know the names still of the excellent teachers. And this is still, I think, something what we see until today, that it makes a person, that is a person who makes a success of yeah, schools of thought and also of legal teaching. Thank you very much.